Okay, it's, uh, I think it's time to start. Uh, I wouldn't like to, to be late, so we'll have time to, to discuss uh, during the panel. So I would like to, to, thank, uh, to thank everyone who, who is joining uh, this, uh, this session. I think we're gonna have a very interesting panel. Um, let me maybe share my screen. I have a, just a few slides to... Uh, Okay, I guess you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Yes, okay. So we, we have the, the honor and the, the great uh, joy to have with us uh, uh, three, actually it's, the panel is organized by uh, myself and Martin and we have the, the honor to, uh, to have with us uh, 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 Dina demser fussman uh, I guess that uh, most of you were also uh, joined the invited talk session. So uh, Dina uh, heads the natural language processing group at the Lister Hill Center for Biomedical Communications at the USNLM. Uh, her lab research is multimodal question answering and text processing for clinical decision support. Uh, she already mentioned very interesting things in, the, uh, in her invited talk that we will have the chance to, uh, to elaborate. <clears throat> Also, we have uh, with us uh, Keith, uh, Keith Hall, uh, who is a research scientist at Google. He leads a team for engineers and researchers working on developing tools and models for search and discovery for scientific publications. Uh, and his team actually has uh, built the Google COVID Research Explorer and the Google Biomed Explorer. Um, also have with us uh, Hong Zhu, uh, and uh, as uh, the head of uh, intelligence services group at Atipon, Hong leads the R&D and implementation for cloud-based solution that leverages advanced AI, big data, and related technologies, as well as the design of Atipon's next generation information discovery system. And he's closely focused on supporting publishers and researchers' uh, success in the open access and open uh, science movements. Uh, also, as I said, we have also uh, with us uh, Martin Kralinger, who is also the uh, co-organizer of the BioAsk, and uh, he's leading the Messiness task. Uh, Martin is the head of the text mining uh, unit at the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. Uh, he's responsible uh, of the health-related activities of the Spanish plan of the, advancement of the advancement of language technology. He works on the development of biomedical and clinical text mining application, including clinical NER and semantic indexing components. And he's one of the main organizers of the BioCreative channels, as well as other biomedical NLP -SER tasks like BioAsk. So welcome all. Um, as I said, it's an honor to have you here. And I think we have very interesting uh, things to discuss. Uh, Keith is with us. I, I don't know. I cannot see. Ah, yes, yeah, he's here. Yes, yeah, sorry. I couldn't see the. Yeah, yes, great. So uh, we decided to focus uh, this panel to uh, the benefit and uh, as if we can put a title on the panel, uh, on the panel uh, topic, it would be the explicit and implicit benefits from challenges like BioAsk. Um, and uh, probably we can start in, you know, in uh, after Dina's talk that she talks about, uh, you know, the challenges during the COVID uh, era, if we can say era. Uh, I think it, it's, it's a good uh, point to start about how challenges can aid in emergencies uh, like uh, COVID-19. Uh, so you, we have seen several uh, tasks and challenges that have arise. Uh, Dina describes the trek uh, related ones. BioAsk also has a, the BioAsk synergy task, and there are more, uh, where all of them try to tackle uh, issues related to COVID. Uh, and uh, I would like to hear the, the opinion of the panelists or what's the direction and how they see this goes on uh, in the future. So probably, Dina, you can start as you had also made by talk and probably you can say a few words of that if you want. Yes, so, um, you know, I, I believe um, the challenges help us explore the approaches that no one, well, I don't know, you know, <laughs> uh, probably big companies could explore the uh, challenges that we have on their own, but one single research group could never explore all the approaches in that short amount of time 
that the groups do uh, when they um, participate in challenges. And, you know, uh, you all probably know the NIST um, point that they always try to make, that this is not a competition. And when I participated, particularly when I started participating, um, I never got that point. For me, it was a competition and I wanted to win it. But as I grow older, I think I do believe more into uh, in the, um, yes, competition, but it's good to have that competition. And the main point is not winning, but exploring as a community all these approaches and sharing. Okay, thank, thank you very, thank you very much, Dina. Uh, uh, Hong, do you want to, to add something on that? Or? Sure, sure. I totally agree, uh, agree with Dina, Dina. And uh, you know, the all I think the output of this competition is a uh, is a win-win situation. So everyone will win, no matter you know the first or the second or something. And the, the because I'm working in the academic publishing industry. So one of the challenges in the, regarding the COVID-19 is you know, there's two, two challenges for us. One is you know, the, how can we speed up you know, the, uh, from the, the, the manuscript writing up to the publishing, reduce the time so that you know, the other, publish, uh, other the researchers can see the latest research you know, work. And the second is you know, how we can help you know, the researchers to quickly to, and then discover and find the information they are looking for. So I think this is a two, and, and the third one. Third one is, you know, the because as a corporate, the we want to always want to collaborate with, you know, the, the best, the most relevant researchers to tackle, you know, the some uh, the tasks. For example, COVID-19 and the, some drug companies want to do it. So this challenge, about ask the challenge can, provide uh, this environment and the opportunity so that the, we all, you know, the researchers uh, incorporate, you know, the internal R&D team and the, you know, the institutions uh, can work together, can know each other, can share the, you know, their, the, can brainstorming, can share the, the best idea. So I think this is the three things, you know, that we definitely benefit from this. Yeah, thanks. Okay, th thank you, Hong. Uh, Keith? Do you want to collaborate on more on that? Or? Uh, yeah, sure, just briefly. Uh, I mean, in general, challenges are really good for rallying the research community. And, and that you know, is true inside a big company as well as you know, at uh, academic institutions. Uh, it, you know, if we didn't actually focus them towards important tasks, then we'd all just work on Wikipedia, which you know, tends to be where all the other challenges go. So it is very important you know, that there you know, are organizations that will you know, take on creating challenges that uh, attract the attention of all research communities, in, including those inside large corporations. And I mean, for us, uh, you know, we collaborated with other teams inside Google Research uh, to work on Trek COVID. Uh, that might not have happened without Trek COVID being around. And uh, that's, you know, it's really great. I do like the idea that it's competition, but it's good for all because in the end, you know, we all learn what techniques work the best and uh, that should help us, you know, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Martin, you want to add something on, on this? So, so I, I'm, the only thing maybe to add there is it's really a way to actually generate resources in a very, let's say, transparent way, meaning that you generate or share data, supposedly also partially you share the methodology behind these solutions, in some cases code, and in some cases even like predictions or aut automatic, like let's say results. In addition to, I would say, um, sharing also like uh, or being a, a platform to, to interact and share experiences, like to learn, learn from others. And, and that's something which is really key if you have like emergency sit situations, you need to learn how different people are solving a similar problem. And I think, you know, these virtual environments and, and engaging different kinds of communities is, you know, is key and challenges are a, a way to promote these kind of things, no? It's my opinion, especially rapidly changing topics, rapidly changing content, 
and with real end user demands, I mean, this is an efficient way to solve the problem, I would say. Yeah, thank you, Martin. I, I agree with all of you. Uh, and uh, I think th this can move us also to the second topic we want to discuss is that I think that now the, the goal is to try to move challenges from, you know, the very uh, participant, if I can say, oriented task where we're trying to uh, solve problems that are fitted on, you know, specific methods and try to, um, to put uh, you know, a context that is easy for the participants to, to, to work on, to, to move to more realistic tasks, uh, like it is now uh, all the COVID-related tasks and even more, and try to work also on real data and not um, data that ha has been built only for the scope of the challenge and that really um, well manipulated in the way that is, is, is easy for the systems, but are really far from the real, uh, real life. Uh, challenges. Um, and so I think this, this is going to be uh, also the future on, on having challenges on realistic data. Uh, and the way I see it, and I want your opinion on that, is in order to achieve this, uh, is we have to, uh, to have the, the end users of, of the task that we're trying to, uh, to work on, if it's a question answering for, uh, for biomedical experts, to have the biomedical experts, for example, get involved uh, in the design of the challenges, and uh, not only to have them as evaluators or, uh, uh, you know, annotators, because what we're trying to, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do with the challenges is to, to meet their needs. Uh, so my opinion is that we need to involve them in the design of the new tasks and challenges in order to try to, to, to go uh, more to more realistic tasks and more realistic data. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Keith, do you want to, to, to add something on that? Uh, well, um, I mean, more realistic tasks, I, the, you know, one task that we've come across with some people we work with, uh, you know, especially in large pharma, um, you know, is systematic review. And uh, that's something where, you know, systematic review is done differently in different fields. Uh, and at least in biomedicine, you know, there, there is a traditional evidence-based medicine technique, uh, and it doesn't necessarily interact perfectly with the way uh, modern retrieval and uh, you know, QA type systems work. And maybe a challenge that it, you know, I think uh, synergy is one challenge which starts touching on that, where you're actually asking questions where you, you know, you don't know the answer if it's there, you don't know that there's a specific paper. Um, but even more so also having a challenge where you really are trying to cover uh, multiple different dimensions along a particular question and, you know, or clinical question in, in this context uh, where many systematic reviews are focused around some core uh, clinical question. I think, you know, those types of, um, I mean, it's not easy to, uh, if it was easy, we'd probably already have a challenge related to this, right? But those types of real world tasks keep popping up for us that there are many, uh, you know, customers in our case that actually, you know, want to do literature, literature search uh, more in a more streamlined fashion, uh, but still have the same sort of analysis and results that uh, that you get when you use the traditional like PICOS approach to doing uh, evidence based medicine. Okay, thank you, Keith. Uh, Martin? Uh, do, you, do you think the, this is something that uh, is feasible or how feasible it is and how you see it uh, coming? So um, I think maybe we should actually have the end user in the loop of the design. So I think this is key to understand their needs. And, and even for like in semantic indexing, there's so many ways on um, framing a realistic task in terms of reducing indexing time, uh, increasing efficiency, increasing consistency. Uh, decreasing the cost, uh, un indexing unlabeled data collection. So there, there might be quite a lot of different realistic scenarios and each of them would have slightly different way on uh, evaluation, even the metrics or even the data on the data side on selecting the appropriate data. Um, so I think it's difficult to solve and there's some interface or even the user interaction in there as well. So I think it's very complex, but we should actually explore a little more the different, let's say, usage scenarios of these very systems and have the end user also in the loop of the design. Sometimes maybe just a quality metric is not enough for them. 
uh, and we don't really. It, I think we, we we're very comfortable in in with the traditional evolution scenarios and metrics, but we don't go beyond that in many cases. So I I think we should think about realistic tasks, but maybe also know where we should stop there as well. Where you know it's not 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 a task of the our community, it's a task of, of another community, you know, like interface design and in user interaction, these kind of things. Okay, so thank you, Martin. Uh, Hong, you want to? Yeah, uh, I, I think the one of the distinct, the distinct uh, feature of the bio ask is that the task is, uh, is actually it's come from real life with real data. For example, the mesh tagging task from the NL is uh, annotated to the new Madeline citation. So actually the performance is, uh, you know, is increased from the 50% to the 0.70%, which is 27%, you know, the improvement. I think that all this has already highlighted the success of the BioAsk. Um, but regarding the, the new, you know, the realistic uh, tasks, I agree with Martin. We can, you know, the, we definitely need, you know, we can add the more task with the more data to meet the the real, you know, the requirement in the real, you know, the application. For example, as end-to-end -end question answers, can we provide the, you know, the uh, text without, you know, the annotated snippets or something to get the answers? Or we can, you know, the, can we do the semantics index not only based on the abstract but also based on the full text all based on the selected, you know, the sections, because of many sections is, a, is very important in the research work. And also, you know, the, can, we, can we add also, you know, regarding the information retrieval, currently we focus on the return, the, you know, the um, bit only based on the content similarity and the query, but can we add and can we add also the others information, for example, the users information, the interests or the history or something to, pro, to, in, to identify or pro, evaluate the more personalized information retrieval. So this is, I think that's something we can think because the personalization is, you know, the one of the, and is a trend, is one of the, you know, the, the direction and think the, many industries is a uh, is follow thanks yeah thank you Hong. Dina? Uh, yeah just sort of reinforce that yes. um it's hard to determine where the the um the challenge becomes more about solving some someone's specific problem as opposed to developing computational approaches and advancing our research fields. So I, I think the task absolutely should be um, the, the latter, not the former, because uh, someone's specific problem is probably better solved by um, if they targeted some company and, and got that. And the other part is we are always hunting for the evaluation metrics that actually reflect the end result. And this is really hard. So um, there is probably more research to come in, in the evaluation metrics and how they, they should bias the systems towards the task. Exactly, Dina, I, I totally agree. And I think also one point that has to do with evaluation metrics, that most of them are now focused on which system is better and uh, which computational method is better. And probably we need some metrics or I don't know if it's metrics or way to evaluate how good is the task for, for the users uh, that it, it tackles. Uh, a, a simple one can be the, the one that we are using, for example, in biosynergies questionnaires to the experts uh, to tell us their opinion on the task and if it's helpful and what they see that could be get better, but of course, better ways could also, you know, the, the, there could be better, I don't know, some, uh, uh, I could think of some workshop or, you know, some events uh, with, with the end users to, to, to go deeply more in their needs and how, how this could go to, to a more realistic task, if you can say, and, uh, and go more towards their needs. 
Okay, great. Thank you all. And I would like to mention, I didn't mention in the beginning, if someone from uh, from the audience wants to, to 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 add something or want to ask something, please free, please feel free to to participate. Uh, we want also your opinion on that. Um, okay, so. Uh, Moving to the third point, uh, which also very closely relate to what we discuss, is having realistic tasks uh, for the, for the end users that we're working on can help us move also the challenges from 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 tasks to potential applications. So we're doing all this effort, all these years to have uh, you know have challenges running for years and uh, tasks running. Um, uh, running have systems that get better and better, have very good accuracies, etc. Uh, but I think the ultimate goal of this challenge is try to create applications for the users to be to, 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 to be used. Uh, and uh, one example like I can think of is, uh, for example, the, the semantic indexing of BioAsk. Uh, as we have NLM uh, working closely with us and helping us, we have seen that actually methods that have been developed during the challenge uh, have been used and the, the participants have collaborated with NLM at the end and now the, uh, the, the MTI indexer uh, has, been, has become better based on the help, if we can say, of the system that had participated in BioAsk. Uh, so this is one application I can see that is, is there and uh, how the challenge can ha have helped in real life and in a real application. But of course, there are many more to, to come. Uh, for example, for the question answering, I have not seen, at least from the BIOS side, something to have come in, you know, in real practice, but in, a, in a real application. Uh, so I would like to, to hear your opinion on that. So Hong, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. I, I think the first thing I want to uh, make a point I want to make is uh, BIOS case actually is designed for the real problem with real data. So I think it's not hard to move from the challenge tasks to the potential applications. I actually you know the, because you know the, in my experience, I have seen the many, you know, the uh, application based on the, you know, the semantic, uh, you know, the indexing, the classification, classifications, label classifications. For example, the, and also, you know, the, it's you, uh, you know, output this task, we will speed up the content discoverability and the readability. For example, all these topics which the identified in the during the semantic indexing can be displayed in the article, so that helps the reader and the user to quickly understand what this information, what at this article is talking about. And also, we can add this, uh, this all these topics and uh, the classified topics in the recommendation. We will recommend or suggest some of the relevant, you know, articles, and we can, you know, make uh, explainable. So we say why we explain this, uh, why we suggest this article, because this article has the similar topics with this the one you are reading, and also you know that we can use. An, another point I try to make is you know the 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 all the technology and the multi class multi label classification and the, you know, the developed in the biomedical domain could be used in the other domain as well, in the social sense, in the engineering, as long as they have, you know, the taxonomy available, et cetera. And another, another you know, the application, another two applications I have seen, you know, the so far, which could be the, based on the, the multi-level and classification is one is called the research analytics. So basically identify the trending topics, the most influential journal, paper, researchers in specific area. This is all based on the tag topics. And also the in the marketing, you know, in the marketing e-commerce marketing industry, we, we need to you know the identify the user profiling, do the user profiling. How can we do this? Sometimes it can be done by based on the user behavior interaction with a certain content. And this certain content, this content can be represented by a list of the topics which get from the semantic indexing. So this is a many the different, many different uh, application we could be used based on the, the, the technology solutions developed in this challenge. 
But the ones, the last point I want to make is the the output of the research the competition is not only you know is not only for the publication to publishing the paper, but actually the more important for me is to solve the real problem in the world. Thanks. Exactly. Thank you, Hong. Uh, uh, Dina. Yeah. So um, just continuing with Hong said, um, the. <laughs> It's sort of funny, right? So I'm in a place where um, previously it was our task to take it from research into applications. And we have done that, for example, with our image retrieval open eye search engine, where uh, we presented our work to our board of scientific counselors. And they said, and the questions we had for the board was, should we continue exploring new approaches to combining image features and text, or should we uh, create a system for the public to retrieve all these images from PubMed Central articles? And they said both. And you know, it took us a year to actually put the system into production because the ideas were there, but make it real time make it scalable, make it, you, you know, all of these, it is also research, but it is engineering, software and hardware engineering research. So, uh, and this is, so with the new board of scientific counselors now, they are saying, no, actually your job is done when you publish the paper. And that engineering part, People will use your ideas. And I think this is true because, you know, it's very hard to know which parts of our research contributed to some commercial tool that is using, say, mesh indexing, or that is using uh, some of the named entity recognition approaches that we have developed. So we have not developed the products uh, or, you know, the commercial strength products. Uh, for many of the research uh, ideas that we have done, but hopefully there, and, and it's very hard um, to like say, oh, this comes from there for so many reasons, right? Maybe someone just sort of like read the article and doesn't even remember that they read the article. So there's a lot of, I think that if um, you do good research, it's probably okay to stop uh, with a good research result and not necessarily take it into the application. And I wish there was a way to, for the applications to acknowledge where some of their sources are coming from. But again, uh, we had these discussions at the National Library of Medicine with uh, our policymakers, and they were saying, well, this is a double edged sword because then people say, if uh, someone says, I used the product uh, of NLM to develop this tool. Someone might say this is endorsed by NLM, which we don't do, or worse yet, if it's really bad, they will then say, oh, look what NLM has done. So it, it's it's a bit tricky. Yeah, I see your point. And, and the, this is the more practical thing on how you go from, from the, the talent or the research you're doing to the application. And, you know, it's, it's a real issue. I, I totally understand. Uh, where, yes, I, I think I think it's an open question. Uh, I think that the one thing has to do with the more abstract thing of how, how we design the talent is in order to be able to go to uh, at the end to, to an application and the other one is a more practical on how we, we having the idea and having things there how how we really uh, going to application where it's more as you said engineering and uh, uh, engineering thing uh, but also policy thing <laughs> as you uh, really mentioned thank you thank you Dina Martin <clears throat> so um, my, my comment is like uh, I think to generate this application, you need to get access to the system somehow. Uh, there have been this, been this effort to like have a code submission kind of um, evaluation scenarios, for, which for our cases, I think they're you know, not really suitable. They're too complex solution and you would ban somehow commercial participants. We tried to do something like in BioCreative, have like web services, as, uh, online submission through web services. These are not really well maintained. So they are gone after a while. 
we did even some benchmarking on basically what, what Dina said. I mean, it's not just quality, it's also robustness, scalability, how efficient these, these tools are when applied like in, in the real settings. And we did some evaluation on that side, but still these systems are gone after some time. So I'm really frustrated with the not getting access to code. The code isn't, you cannot run the code. The web services are gone after some time. Uh, and I, I think there should be some way to actually pr promote that people are actually sharing part of their system in a way that people can make use of them. So if you don't do that, then these systems will never turn into real application if it's not a commercial solution, a commercial participant directly exploiting their code. Um, yeah, so I'm a little frustrated, I have to say, from the academic participants that there's not enough effort in, you know, turning their participants, the participating system into some useful code, which is also interoperable, scalable, robust enough to be used for potential applications. Yeah, this is a good point. And this is something what, that we have also seen and then discussed. And uh, we have also discussed if, if there are ways to motivate, them, to motivate the participants on having, you know, their, their code uh, uh, good maintained and explainable and reproducible, et cetera. And I don't know if a task on that would be useful, you know, to have people working on, on making their system like this. Uh, but um, <laughs> um, as, as a comment, I think they're actually different communities, so like the software engineers. So we yes. saw when we had the web service task, they really are not the NLP people or deep learning, machine learning, they're really more technical software engineering experts. And, you know, they're, they're different kind of communities. I'm afraid that it's true. there might be just different people. Yes, but probably yeah. to try to bring these people together and uh, help each other, that would be, you know, a, a way. Uh, I, I totally agree. So I just add one more point built on the, what Martin said. And, uh, for the researcher and researcher and the commercial applications, uh, you know, the company have the different the objective goals when they develop solutions. Researchers, you know, the way we participate the challenge, we focus on to, to develop the most, you know, the, the, the best solutions, which you know, the, achieve the best, the highest accuracy, et cetera. But in the re real applications, we not necessarily focus on the, the, the highest, you know, the score, the accuracy, but we focus on the, you know, most reliable, scalable, and the solutions. Sometimes even we, you know, the we sacrifice in the accuracy a little bit, is still okay. So I think the, the most important thing is how can we balance these two, you know, when we talk about, you know, move from the challenge task to potential application. We need to align with our different objectives and have the balance between these different objectives. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all for the contributions. Um, going to a more technical, if I can say, uh, point, uh, something that have come up and I think everybody is, uh, uh, is having a question about that is, now, now that we have moved to the deep learning era where all methods, more, most of the metho methods are, you know, deep learning based and uh, uh, where uh, we're wondering where the traditional approaches fit in and tools and uh, uh, in what way they're useful or not. Um, Martin, do you want to, to, to elaborate on that as you are also the, the person who, who wanted to discuss also this issue? Um, um... Well, my message would be more, I'm missing a little more what would be a baseline. So when you have all these extra, more sophisticated methods, I'm, I'm missing a little more with very simple tools, you know, what is actually the gain and to focus more on where to apply the deep learning or more sophisticated cases. So in, in our case, like the indexing trust, there's, there's, there's an areas with few data and uh, there's an areas with enough data. And uh, here, like the quality and what kind of data you would need to have to fully exploit, let's say the cutting edge deep learning, uh, and also to use them for somehow the aiding in the data preparation process and being more efficient in actually generating the data which is needed for, for the deep learning part. I think I'm missing these two things, like, more like a baseline and how to actually fully exploit the deep learning for scenarios where deep learning can be used in terms of label data and preparation of label data. 
Yeah, th thank you, Martin. Keith? Uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of questions here, right? So, so you know, uh, traditional approaches do offer you a little more introspection into the predictions that the model makes. Uh, maybe not all of them, but but many of them do. And uh, you could say it's a, it's a little more difficult to understand uh, the predictions that the models are making in in the you know with neural models. Uh, there's a lot of work on explainable AI and and identifying. Um, you know, rationales for the decision making, you know, the inferences that uh, neural models are making. Um, it's not exactly taking advantage of traditional approaches. Uh, it's more uh, trying to find ways to attach uh, functionality that we had with the traditional approaches that we're missing with, you know, super complicated neural models that have millions of parameters and uh, their interaction is somewhat opaque. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think it's, uh, th there's also a post hoc analysis of, you know, what the predictions are that a deep learning model makes. And there, I think some of the traditional approaches may be of use, right? So you can identify which entities are actually being identified in the query and the, uh, result if you're doing retrieval, say, and, um, you know, you can make some assertions. You're not actually saying why the model made that prediction, but at least you can do some statistical analysis based on some of the predictions that are more interpretable. Um, so I think that doing more of that or, or setting it up so that we have to do more of that. I mean, you can definitely, you know, maybe going back to the uh, previous point, right? You can definitely try to configure challenges such that this type of, you know, rationales are required, right? Or that there's some, you know, analysis that, you know, a further level of analysis, right? Right now, you know, we have things like, you could say snippets are a rationale, right? For why the document is returned, um, but you could get even more granular uh, in that way. Yeah, I totally agree that this explainability uh, acts is very important nowadays and uh, with a deep learning method, it's more needed than ever. And also for the users, it's very interesting. Uh, Dina. Yeah, so um, I guess pitching the um, establishing these simple baselines to participants, uh, that's probably the challenge participation is probably the only place where you can still publish the <laughs> simple baseline. Uh, because I think in um, many other venues, you could probably have it as a simple baseline compared to your other deep learning approaches or maybe trying to explain um, the statistics, they sort of use it for descriptive statistics of the data, but not just publish a, an approach um, without deep learning approaches, to be honest. Um, and I, I, it will be interesting to know that, you know, what is a baseline, what do you guys consider a baseline approach? Say um, the, now the traditional machine learning approaches like SVM or, you know, a lot of logistic regression is still used. So is that something that you will consider baselines or should that like be uh, waiting for its next prime time and the baselines could be some regular expressions or something like that. Yeah, yeah, right. Thank you, Dina. Hong? Okay. Uh, I, I think the, the both traditional approach, like the rule-based dictionary lookup, or even the, you know, the machine learning like the SVM, as Dina said, and also the deep learning method and as transformer, all, they have their own weakness and the strengths. And traditional approach are usually, as we all know, are usually easy to understand and explainable and also use less data. On the other hand, the deep learning method are usually more complicated, it's black box, or need more data to, to achieve high accuracy. So I, I guess it's really depend on the real scenario and use cases to see we can then we can choose the most suitable approach to to solve the problem yeah that's my opinion yes okay thank you thank you all 
Uh, no, I think there are very interesting points or everything that we have discussed. And uh, the last uh, the last minute of, of the panel, I would like your vision or your opinion on how you see the challenges to 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 uh, to to um, to go on in the in the next year, so say in the next decade, do you think it's going to continue as it is? So I think the last ten years, if we can go back ten years, uh, I think that the uh, the main changes I have seen uh, it's uh, of course the the thing that we discuss now that we have a, a real a real change on the methods that they are used. So we have this deep learning. A uh, wave that came, and you know the the approaches have changed, and also the volume of the data has changed. Uh, but I think the format, if I can say, of the challenges haven't changed much. Uh, I don't, and I, I don't know if you see this change, uh, how this will go on in in the next years to come. For for my point of view, I think the, the things that we have discussed that we should go or we will go. I don't know if we'll go. What what how I imagine it. Uh, to go to a more realistic task and have the, the end users getting involved. Um, I think uh, it's uh, it's something that that, that should should come. Uh, I don't know if it will come, but I, I can see it coming. I don't know what's your opinion on how you see the challenges changing, if there will be any change in the, in the years to come. Um, so Hong, do you want to, to start? Um, sure. So basically, I guess you ask what's the future the challenge yes. look exactly. like. Okay. So I think the I can think about the four four directions. So one is you know about the con content enrichment with the uh, multi modalities of content information in the same the semantic space because currently we mainly focus on text uh, semantic space. But in the future, especially when the 5G is becoming ready, I see more and more the multimedia content like images, videos, is become more popular, common. So how can we extract the semantic information from these different types of the content into the same semantics space to enrich this, to enrich you know, the text uh, content? I think this is uh, something, one, one thing we, we can think about it. And the second one, is move from NLP to the you know natural language understanding and natural language generation. Actually, natural language understanding, I think we have already touched it. So it's semantic, semantic the indexing to identify topics. But how about the next natural language generation? So the machine in the future, I think machine is not only a reader to understand the content, but also is a content creator. Actually, the machine has already been used to create, to generate content now in the many sports news, short, short news and the stuff. So it's interesting. So when we discuss this, can, can we add some tasks about, for example, the summarization competition, summarization tasks to allow the machine to generate the summarization, either in you know, one sentence summarization or normal summarization or structured summarization. So sec the third one is now we move, we not provide the content, but we try to provide the knowledge to the customer. Uh, is it possible for us to build a biomedical knowledge graph in the competition, which contains the you know, predefined entities and re relationship? So the different teams can contribute to improve and refine the graph. And the, the last one, because uh, I keep reading the, all the AI trending, the one of trend is from the perception of AI to the cognitive AI. So today is a perception AI doing very well. So they sometimes they have already equal or exceed human performance in the vision, the songs, rec speech recognition extra. But human are good at reasoning and the inference, which is a, Con cognitive AI is about. So can, can we add some tasks about the reasoning inference, inference to identify the new insights or the missing connections or hidden knowledge based on the knowledge we extracted? Because most 
all this hidden knowledge or missing connections between the entities and the knowledge point are very valuable. It could be the future, the hypothesis could be the future research direction. So this is my opinion, thanks. Thank you, Hong, very interesting points indeed. Um, uh, Keith, you want to go on? Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I really like that, Hung. Uh, there's some uh, great points there. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, maybe going along in that direction, uh, the current challenges do seem to be focused around uh, search, right? And, and actually, you know, finding information, whether it's, you know, answer to a question or particular uh, papers, uh, and maybe a little less about discovery and exploration. And you know, part of that might be you know, a question of who the users are, right? That, that the applications might apply to. Um, uh, you know, and, and to uh, Dina's uh, previous you know, point, we shouldn't just build challenges that are directed at single you know, user use cases, right? But instead, if we do understand the full set of intents, uh, when people are you know, investigating or using some engine over the scholarly literature, if we understand the intents and maybe focus, you know, the challenges might focus on new intents which we haven't explored yet, maybe because the tools just haven't been there yet, right? So some of it might be summarization over result sets or even summarization that allows you to do further exploration or discovery of new you know, aspects of literature that you didn't find just by you know, initiating with a particular question, right? And I think there, uh, you know, it's, there's, there's a little bit of a, um, you know, chicken and egg. Do we create a new challenge that inspires new solutions that might in, inspire a new set of uh, tools that uh, changes the way people, you know, explore in literature, in scholarly liter literature? Or, you know, do we see what people are building now and see are there challenges that, you know, like can actually address the problems that they're trying to build? Maybe they're not, you know, great, but, you know, and, and you know, that there is a little bit of, uh, you know, we have to be visionary in thinking of what might be useful. Uh, and at the same time, think about, you know, what are the things people are already trying to do where we don't have any challenges related to that. And, uh, you know, and not, not as, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, specific things, but more general cases of exploration or summarization where, uh, you know, people are trying to do this and are trying to incorporate it in their uh, tools and demos. And, uh, you know, what are the users, uh, hope to get out of that or what is the actual user model that we have for building those and then what challenges might actually address those user models uh, I mean hopefully um, you know it ties it together a lot of you know pieces here of everything we've talked about realistic tasks and whether you know like what the potential applications are and exactly what the interplay is when developing a challenge you know between the potential tasks and you know how realistic it is and how much that has to be tied to a potential task or an existing uh, or application or an existing application and so on. So, um, and that, you know, I mean, it leaves out the deep learning part, but the deep learning part actually throws in this, there's a whole bunch of new inferences that we're making at much higher accuracy. It's surprisingly, you know, high accuracy with our uh, sophisticated correlation machines, right? And uh, there, I think, uh, you know, there are gonna be all sorts of new things that we haven't necessarily taken into account, and maybe we need to think about how can we be flexible, uh, and how can you generate new data and have new pipelines to annotate data that might actually be a little bit different than the existing um, annotation procedures and tasks that we have. Thank you, thank you, Keith. Hey, Dina. Yeah, uh, all excellent points. So, <laughs> very little to add, I think, but uh, you know. The bottleneck then in these new challenges is going to be evaluations because we are still sort of um, relying on individual subjective manual judgments in most cases. So again, a, a really interesting, how can we change the evaluation paradigm? And I know there was, I think Martin was involved in these silver standard years ago. So there were some thoughts, but we are still at that model of evaluation that we have. And another thought is that um, the challenges also multiply over the years. And what I really like about this uh, 
COVID related challenges, there was a lot of synergy where uh, each group did something different and it all contributed. And also the timelines were such that people could participate in all of these. So I think going forward, the whatever challenges um, are there, it will be nice to continue that um, collaboration uh, among the organizers so that the tasks don't step over each other, but are actually beneficial. Yeah, very, very good point also with evaluation. Thank you, Dina. Uh, Martin? So it's, I just, you know, want to, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with Dina. I think one thing is having the expert in there, tag a little, learn a little and see how we can actually, you know, both uh, generate maybe data in a different way, have the end user in the loop. But what I think is even more important is to align the different, let's say, silos or task types uh, um, using some common data collection, like the named entity resolution, summarization, machine translation, question answering. So if like all these uh, traditional benchmark scenarios, but aligned somehow through, you know, in some common evolution and data collection and not like for each task, a different data, a different kind of people doing it. They're not aligned, not in time, not in scope, not in metrics. Uh, and they're, they're basically competing with uh, participants. The four months are very heterogeneous. So really have some effort where you would join the different tasks uh, uh, towards a common goal. And you could actually exploit better what can be extracted by one particular component and applied to another evolution setting. Um, I think, you know, otherwise, I don't think you can advance um, more very efficiently if you're not, not aligning the different kind of problems and tasks and even efforts and evaluating them. So I think the COVID-19 effort was very interesting, but there's still, you know, many dispersed uh, efforts and evaluating very specific things and they're not really coordinated. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Thank, thank you, everyone. I think the, the, the points that you have mentioned are all very important and uh, uh, I, would, I would like to, you know, I hope we can meet in, a, I don't know, in 10 years from now and uh, discuss on how things have really evolved and if any of these directions that we have discussed have actually uh, been met. Uh, I think we're running out of time. Uh, I think it was a very, very interesting panel, very interesting discussion. I think many questions were raised and very, uh, very useful things were, were said. I would like to thank you all for participating. It was an honor to have you here. Um, uh, I think uh,